I'm a head of Open Pilot. Uh, my presentation will be uh, will be about Open Pilot. Um, so the responsibility of the Open Pilot team is basically all the code that lives on your device, so your comma two or your comma three. Uh, from the research team, we get this nice blob of weights from the neural net, and then it's our job to run this as stable as possible, um, to interface with a whole bunch of cars, uh, and to do this reliably. We're basically trying to build this the most stable robotics platform that's possible. So um, in my presentation, um, I'll be going over some open pilot features. Uh, I'll be taking you uh, on a, like a history tour. Um, but I'll start off with this. Uh, solving self-driving cars is uh, a software problem only. Um, some people think this is what a, a self-driving car looks like. It's a, a, comp a car filled with computers because otherwise, yeah. You can never build a self-driving car. Uh, of course, we don't think this is true. Uh, if you uh, would ask someone at a traditional self-driving car company what you would need, uh, they would say you need a lot of cameras, you need a LiDAR, of course you need a LiDAR, uh, you need a radar, you need IMU, so a gyroscope, um, an accelerometer, a GPS, and definitely a trunk full of computers. Um, well, everyone knows that LiDAR is a scam, so we can immediately cross that off the list. So people use this to make their HD maps and then localize themselves in the in the HD map to do their planning on. Um, yeah, that doesn't scale, so definitely no liner. Um, I can also say confidently that a trunk full of computers is not going to be necessary. Um, we can run OpenPipe very comfortably on the Comma 2, and the Comma 3 is even better. Um, so yeah, and the, it, it's not a problem of compute. I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, definitely not CPU. Um, then we can also cross radar off the list. I've been, we've been using radar for quite a while. Um, I looked a lot into the data that the radar gives us, but the data is actually pretty shitty. Uh, you get this like one line, you get all these false positives. It's really hard to tell apart like a, a stationary car or, or like a manhole cover. Um, so we very quickly switched to a system where we only use vision uh, to tell if a car is there or not. And then we still use the radar to um, to give us a speed because the, the radar gives us a Doppler shift, uh, which is an instant measurement of the speed, which is very nice, but we're also moving away from this and just trusting the model to give us the, the relative velocity of the car. Uh, and Tesla is doing this now as well. So this shows us that this is very, very possible. Um, and I would say an IMU and a GPS are kind of optional for the, the driving part. Uh, over time, our models have become very good at estimating the motion that the car is going through. It will tell us the, the rotational velocities and the, and the accelerations and the velocities. Um, and the GPS, like, of course, you can drive through a tunnel. So without a GPS, it's very possible to drive. Um, but yeah, for ground truthing, those things are very nice. So we definitely put those on. Uh, and then the most important part is the cameras. Uh, if you have some very good cameras, which the Comma 3 has, uh, this should be all you need. This is what it, a human drives with their eyes. So yeah. um, good cameras are very important and the cameras on the Comma 3 are really amazing. Uh, I worked quite a bit with them already. Um, George talked about the 120 dB of dynamic range. Uh, they, they do HDR, they do full four exposures at the same time. Uh, so you can have four exposures and each successive exposure has a 16X slow, uh, shorter exposure time. Uh, so in this way, you can see very dark, but very bright areas at the same time. Um, so yeah, this is uh, kind of what uh, represents OpenPilot uh, over time. Um, we've been running on the on the LE code or the one plus three. And basically, OpenPilot has always filled all the available CPU space, um, but it was always fine. Like if we wanted to try to ship a new feature, we would free up some CPU, we would rewrite something um, in, in C++, make it faster. And then in the end, we always had the CPU available to, to write the feature we want. Um, so yeah, we've been running on 2016 era smartphone for quite a while. Uh, and actually we down clocked the CPU a couple of times uh, just for thermal performance because the, the cooling is really terrible. Uh, but still, we're only using like 65% of the CPU. I mean, the GPU is a different question, but CPU, uh, there's definitely plenty of. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to take you on a tour of OpenPilot features, some, some nice milestones, basically from version 0 0.1 to 
the upcoming release version 0 0.8.7. Uh, this is between 2016 and 2021. Um, so this is basically pre-release. This is the, the Acura ILX with still with a computer in the back uh, and the joystick to engage and disengage. This is what uh, George took the Bloomberg reporter on to, uh, to Vegas. Uh, so this is kind of the shape of OpenPilot. Uh, you can see the, the OpenPilot UI in the bottom left. Um, we still have that debug UI around, so happy to see that that code still exists. Um, and then it was time for the basically the initial open source release, which ran on the, the Common Neo. It's like this whole DIY, the 3D printer bunch. Um, and this is also where the, the neon green color came from. We uh, got a bunch of 3D printers. And when you buy the 3D printer, it comes with uh, a little bit of free filament uh, in the most hideous color you can imagine, of course. Uh, so that's why a bunch of our stuff was neon green. Uh, I think we still have uh, quite a few spools of that left. Um, this is what the UI looked like um, back then. So very engineery, hackery with the, all the green boxes, all the lines, uh, but over time, like got a little nicer as well. Um, then I want to talk about a feature in 0 0.3.7 about model predictive control. Um, I mean, the feature itself is nice, but this was my, my first feature I shipped as an intern uh, after I, I joined Comma. Um, this basically made the, the controls way more smooth uh, instead of some like, it turned it into an optimization problem. So you put in like the position of the lead car and the velocities of the lead car, and then you try to optimize the, the brake and the gas and the steering uh, to get the most smooth maneuvers possible. Uh, and a lot of this code is still around, which is very nice. Um, Harold made some tweaks to it in the meantime, but the, the basic stuff is still around. So it was um, it was pretty cool to see that at Comma when yeah, you write a feature and then in, in a few months you have this running. I mean, at the time I had a few hundred users, but now it's like thousands of users uh, that run your code. Uh, another feature I worked on as an intern was uh, for a question warning. Um, this is when I kind of realized that the power of all the data that Comma has. Uh, so when you, um, at the time, this wasn't no machine learning, but I used the, the model outputs um, to see what the car in front was doing. Uh, and then I made some rules to come up with uh, when to show the four question one. Then I could use all the data to see what if this had any false positives to tweak the algorithm. Uh, and this is, yeah, this really showed the power of the data. And this is probably something the OEMs can't even do. And they have to go to a test track and do some testing. Um, 0 0.4.4 was uh, the big flippening. I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, so when we designed the original Eon, uh, we actually put the selfie camera on the right side of the device, uh, which turned out to be a mistake. Um, when we wanted to start uh, gathering uh, driver monitoring footage, uh, we wanted to put the camera on the left. So we just uh, flipped everything around um, luckily, the Eon case was symmetrical, so uh, with a hex screwdriver, you could take it apart, flip the mounts around, and then put it back in your car. And uh, Chris even made a nice video about that a few years ago. Uh, so yeah, this is the, the first step towards driver monitoring, which is, is very important. Um, when I was going through the release notes, I also noticed this pretty funny thing in version 0.4.6, which said, fix all memory leaks. Uh, I don't think that was actually true, uh, but it was very optimistic at least. In version 0.4.7, we shipped uh, the first model with our improved ground truthing stack. Um, so before we just, we, we tried to recover the path that the, the car took. Uh, we used mostly used the gyroscope for this and then uh, all gyroscopes has a, have a bias, which we didn't remove properly. Uh, so before this point, all the models had like this bias that would point you to slightly towards the right. If you looked in the distance, the model would always do this. Uh, so we had this uh, this fixed offset of one and a half degrees, which we always subtracted before we sent the, the angle to the steering controller. Um, but after this, it was finally gone. So just close, cool to mention. Then in version 0 0.5.0, we shipped driver monitoring. Uh, I'm sure Wishing is going to talk a lot more about the, the driver monitoring. But yeah, as OpenPipe started getting better and better, uh, like in the first version, we had this, uh, this bar that took six minutes to count down and you had to touch the wheel. Um, I mean, six minutes now in hindsight is a very long time, but uh, OpenPilot messed up so so often that you, you felt very proud if you actually hit the, the six minute mark and you're always paying attention. 
Uh, but then as Opaya got better, it, it made less mistakes. And then it became very important to make sure that the driver was paying attention. Um, and yeah, you can you can just make the, the wheel touch time shorter, but at some, some point that just becomes too annoying. Uh, so we actually want to make sure that the user is paying attention. So we look at their face and see if they're looking at the red. Then in version 0.5.8, we open source VisionD. Um, we always joke that we were probably one of the first companies to actually ship a neural net on the edge on like a device in, in the field. Uh, back at the, in the day, we wrote our own OpenCL kernels to do all the neural net stuff. Um, but at some point, we shipped to the SMP, which is a Qualcomm library to do as well. And they have all these, uh, these nice uh, OpenCL kernels. I, we first engineered their, their library once, and they're, they're super tweaked for, for what the, the Snapdragon can do. So they're, they're super good. Uh, so we sw switched to SMP, um, and then so we just decided to, to open source VisionD. Uh, and at that point, all the code in, in OpenPy was open source, which is a pretty cool milestone. Um, then in version 0 0.7.7, uh, we actually started driving on the localizer, so to speak. Um, so all cars, of course, are different. Uh, all the tires have different grip on the road, and this can depend on like how wet the road is, how the temperature, and there's the steering. It's like the manufacturer system, some end-to-end -end ratio usually, but this is not true for all driving. Um, so we try for each car, uh, we try to estimate the vehicle model. Um, and with like 130 car support, this is very important because you can't be measuring this for every car. Uh, so we actually uh, estimate this offline. We look at how the car drives. We look at the, the steering angle, the speed, uh, and then we predict how we think the car should drive. And then we could tweak uh, the vehicle parameters a bit so it matches our expectation. And this is very important for things like banked roads. Uh, so if the road is a little sloped to the left or right, um, then you would start hugging. Uh, but this actually takes care of that. It sees that the, the car is not driving as expected and then compensates for that. Uh, in version 0 0.8.0, we shipped the, the first full 3D driving model uh, that would not only output lanes and paths in X, Y, but also in Z. Um, and this was mostly useful uh, for the, the discussions the OpenPilot team had with research. Uh, we would look at like a, a replay and they would say, no, this model is overestimating the turn. Um, but you have to be very careful because of projection errors that if the, the road would slope up or down a little bit, it would completely throw off how the, the lines looked and the research team always said, no, no, it's not overestimating. It's just, um, it's just a projection. And then, well, it turned out usually in, in a lot of cases we were right. And this is the, one of the bugs that Harold was talking about with the, the yellow lane lines at night. And then in version 0.8.3, we shipped the, the first end-to-end -end lateral model, uh, which is yeah, a big, very big step, which is something that the research team has been working on for a very long time. Uh, and I'm very excited to see what the, the future of this will look like. And then uh, in the same release, we also switched to a, a UI in Qt. We had this massive code base in React Native, all the, the UI was, uh, was an Android APK. And then with, uh, at the time we were already working on the, on the Commons 3 as well. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we moved the whole UI to Qt. It's super responsive now. Um, and it's all, all in, lives in the same open pilot code base. So we didn't have to rewrite all the messaging stuff. In uh, January, 2020, we also made a very important change on how open is developed. So open pilot used to be developed in a cathedral style open source. Uh, which means all the, the development happens behind the scenes. And then when there's a release, you get this dump on GitHub with all the source. Uh, but of course, you want to get contributions from the community. So people still make PRs for things like car support. Uh, this kind of became like a pain to merge um, because like the code base, the public code base was already behind. People couldn't see what we're working on. Uh, we started running all the CI behind the scenes, but then we couldn't run the, the PRs on the CI. Uh, so in January 2020, we just decided to uh, develop everything in open source. Uh, by the time, we also didn't need to test in cars anymore. So uh, we could be pretty certain that if, uh, if our CI passed, that it, the code probably wasn't broken. Uh, so if people started running that on their device, it wasn't such a big deal. Uh, so this was our old mono repo. It was called one. It was, everything was in one repo. Um, yeah, and then this grew over like the three years that we used it. 
uh, but now everything is done in the open pilot repo and you can see this in the in the graph the number of commits went up significantly uh, and now all the all the development is done in the public uh, no no secret stuff even the the common free stuff has been developed in the open some people notice but uh, yeah so yeah i think this uh, this shows us very nicely how far we've come from version 0 0.1 to version uh, 0 0.8.7 um sometimes progress feels slow uh, but it's always good to take a step back and see how far we've come and i think this is very promising for what the future will show us um, if we can get this much out of the 2016 era smartphone i think that proves our point that this is just a software problem and if we just keep chipping away at the software it's just going to keep getting better and better so um what's next um i think the most important part is stability um, it's definitely a few features that still need to be developed, but yeah, stability is very important. So we're um, targeting one hours, or one thousand hours between uh, failures. So it means unplanned disengagement. So this can be anything from a hard reboot, which is very rare now, um, but also like communication error between processes. So if you don't meet the real time deadline uh, or other uh, unexpected like planner failures or model failures. Uh, of course, we're going to start to keep supporting more and more cars. Uh, and the OpenPilot team is also going to prepare uh, running larger models. It's mostly a bandwidth problem with the GPU. Uh, so just by writing the, the, all the processing stages of the video, so it's like all the debayering, um, all the, the all the conversions we do, uh, just to make sure that all runs on the, C on the GPU, stays on the GPU, um, do efficient messaging. So yeah. Uh, and of course, we're going to talk about navigation, but I'm going to talk more about that later. Uh, and I also want to usually thank the community who uh, also make, especially the all the 130 cars we support possible. Uh, you can see this is just pa past month. We had over 200 pull requests merged, which is uh, pretty cool. I think a while back on Hacker News, someone made a tool to see how fast PRs were merged. Um, and it's also cool to see how, how quickly we were processing uh, all these PRs with Quite a small team. Um, but yeah, this this small team um, forces us into certain things, like not writing a lot of code. Uh, but these are usually good things. Like we see this in, in research too. It's like, yeah, we're we're not hiring a cone guy. Uh, we're a small team, so we have to we have to make sure that uh, we have as much leverage as possible. So yeah, this end to end approach makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you have a lot of people, you're tricked into these approaches that don't scale well, and even with all those people still will never work. Uh, so I think this is true for the, the number of lines of code as well. If you, you can do a lot with not a lot of code. Um, so yeah, like the pseudo project, has like over 200,000 lines of code. Um, yeah, and with OpenPy, we're trying to keep the, the number of lines of code below 100,000. And uh, so far we've uh, succeeded. Now we can also plot this over time. Um, so yeah, we're, you can see uh, version 0 0.5.8, there's a big increase when we open source Vision D and Camera D. Uh, and then in version 0 0.7.7, we start to get awfully close to the, the 100,000 line limit. So we did a big cleanup, started to remove all unnecessary code. Uh, and that got us comfortably down to 60,000 again. Um, and this is still an amount of code that one person can keep in their head. Uh, I know what, what all the moving parts are, and this yeah makes it a lot easier to develop on OpenPy as well. Um, but as you can see, the, the number of cars uh, that support it keeps going up. Um, and Robin mentioned this as well nicely that we only need 45 lines of code for each supported car, just because we have very nice car abstraction layers. I um, also want to talk briefly about the hardware that's needed to run OpenPilot. Uh, so in the past, it was the, the common Neo, which was this DIY project. It's like we had this manual on GitHub, you had to 3D print some parts, order a board, um, and then you had to like solder a connector to your car, and you lost all stock system capabilities. Uh, but that's uh, luckily no longer the case. Uh, then we shipped the Eon with the Giraffe, which had some nice switches. Uh, but even as an open as a comma employee, I could never remember what all the switches did. Always had to look it up, so it's not great for usability. Um, and then that was fixed with the, the comma two and the car harness. And 
um, this turned out to be the future, and this is still used for the, the comma three. Um, I'm also going to show a bit of the, the UI progress we made. I think this uh, very nicely shows how much OpenPy has progressed as software. I think the UI quality really nicely shows the the, the state of the, the self-driving code as well. So this is the, the original UI with the nice hacker font. This is what a, something in a movie would look like. But uh, and then sorry to become nicer and nicer. Uh, this is all the React Native stuff. It's turned out to be a mistake in the end. But, uh, and now we have this beautiful Qt UI, which uh, looks really slick. Um, to develop OpenPilot, we also had to develop quite a bit of tools uh, and libraries. Uh, which I'll go over briefly. Um, so we developed Cabana, which is used to reverse engineer the car. Uh, Rob also talked about this a little bit, which produced OpenDBC, which is this big GitHub repository with all the different reverse engineered signals. Um, we also added OpenPilot support to Plot Juggler recently, uh, which is this very smooth, nice plotting library. Uh, so you can plot all the, the signals of all the OpenPilot modules and how they're communicating with each other. It also parses out all the data from the from the canvas, so you can plot those together. Um, yeah, and it can also do live streaming. So if you're testing something in the car, then you can see it live or tuning. Um, this is so much better than all the one-off uh, Jupyter Notebook scripts we used to write, and it's so much faster to debug stuff with this. Um, we're uh, also added support for Carla, which is a great way for new users to experience OpenPilot. Uh, where they can uh, try out OpenPy without a supported car. Um, I mean, Carla is not the most realistic simulator, but I, I use it some, from time to time to see if, like, if I'm writing a new feature, just do some sanity checks, make sure I didn't mess up a sign or anything. It's not steering left when it's supposed to go right. Um, we also uh, made Explorer, um, which is a nice way to view all your drives, uh, all your dash cam footage, uh, but I'll talk more about that later. So yeah, we, um, overall, we made quite a bit of progress. I uh, went from a proof of concept uh, to well, over 3,500 weekly active users. Uh, we went from a 3D printed case to an injection molded case. That's like a real product. product. Uh, we built some nice developer tools in the process. Um, and we also built some very nice libraries. Uh, so we tried to keep the number of dependencies low. Uh, but they also need to be uh, resource efficient. So we wrote message queue. So we used to use zero MQ, which is a nice socket library, uh, but I used quite a bit of CPU. So we wrote our own library, which uses shared memory. Um, research team wrote Leica to do well, GPS processing, and we developed OpenDBC in the, in the process. Um, I also want to talk briefly about my time at Kama. Uh, I have had a great time at Kama so far. Um, just I was looking for an internship, and then I uh, saw the program. I got sent a program challenge, which I thought was a really cool way to hire at the time. Uh, so I tipped, uh, tipped away at the, the chance for a weekend. I was like, well, even if I don't get the internship, at least I had fun for a weekend. Uh, and I think that's a, the, the attitude that gets you into comma. Uh, I did uh, well enough to, uh, to get an internship, which is uh, a great start for my time at comma. I uh, made some great road trips in the US uh, with my comma devices. It's really fun. Uh, we uh, spent some days in the field as well. Uh, this time we're testing AB. We're making sure that all the all the forwarding of, of the AB still worked. Uh, so we went out with uh, Ricardo and Adib and we uh, printed out this, uh, this VW Golf, uh, stuck some aluminum foil to the back, taped it to some boxes. Um, and then we rented this piece of uh, empty track. Uh, and then we just tried to drive into it. It was this game of chicken with the boxes. And as you can see in the bottom right, it didn't always go successfully. Um, I also uh, learned how to hack cars at Karma. Uh, so this is the time we, uh, I guess we wanted to show that flex ray wasn't so insurmountable as people thought. Um, so. The plan was to rent an Audi A4, so Rob and I went up to LA to pick up the, the A4, and um, the person who rented this to us uh, really, uh, he, he said it had all the, the driver assistance features we needed, but it didn't, so we had to give it back immediately. And then we uh, went to a McDonald's and we started looking for other Audis with FlexRay, uh, but the only thing we could find with the driver assistance features was this absurd Q8, uh, so we picked it up in, uh, in Compton. 
Um, and then we uh, then went back to uh, to San Diego for the hackathon, and we immediately filled it with wire, started hacking away. Um, and then after two very long days, we uh, we finally got it to steer. So it was uh, very nice to see that was possible. Uh, I also showed how absurd the use of flex ray is in these cars. Uh, I don't know some some manager probably decided that they need a flex ray, uh, so they put in this uh, this whole flex ray stuff, and then they sent sent the same exact CAN messages as on any VW Golf, but then they send it on this super expensive bus. Um, so not sure why they did this. Uh, this is uh, the Comet 3. This was uh, back in San Francisco. Uh, just we, uh, we decided we wanted to do RTK GPS, where this is where you build like a base station and you can do very accurate GPS. Uh, it was a complete waste of time, but uh, we had a lot of fun building uh, the, Comet the Comet 3. Uh, so I guess it's the, the predecessor of the, of the Comet 3. Um, so we put this uh, big GPS antenna on the roof, got some two, uh, two by fours, um, attached it to the outside of the house, and I had some cables running through the bathroom. Uh, so sometimes when you're taking a shower, like the floor got wet and then the GPS antenna went down. Uh, so that's, I guess that's the, the startup vibe. Um, I want to talk about some announcements. Uh, I think a lot of this already spoiled by George with the navigation. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Connect. So we used to have Explorer and the mobile app Connect, but um, yeah, we decided it was uh, not worth it to deal with Apple and the App Store anymore. Uh, so we decided to just all integrate this into this super nice web app, which is now live at connect.comma.ai. Uh, it has all the features that the, the phone app used to have and, and way more. Um, so yeah. It's really cool. You can see your battery voltage. You can take snapshots. And uh, with the command 3, you can see your live location. And previously, it would just show the, the last, the position of the last drive you took. But now, if your car would get towed, you could actually see the car in real time. Um, and we have now this nice unified experience between desktop and mobile. Um, so yeah, no longer in the App Store. It's a nice progressive web app, which you can add to your home screen. And it will always be up to date. And this change to, to connect was also very important for the next feature for navigation. Uh, because we needed a good way for users to enter their destination to manage their favorites. Um, and like typing a destination on the device is not really, uh, not, not really a nice user experience. Um, so yeah, so we have connect and then we have navigation on the device. Uh, which is just turn by turn navigation, uh, but then integrated into the open pie experience. Uh, so you can go to connect, you type in uh, a location. So if you want to go to a Taco Bell, so that's a very nice reverse geocoding. We'll show you all the, the Taco Bells in the area. Um, and you can add favorites, you can add home and work locations, uh, which will then show up uh, on your device like this. So if you're just uh, starting up your device, you can click home and it will just go there. Um, you can also use the connect to, to set up a destination. Um, so how does so you type in your destination? It will preview the route, and then when you click navigate, it will actually go through Athena. Um, so all the devices um, on the common network have a WebSocket connection open to our server. Um, and then if you're subscribed to Prime, uh, you can use this to uh, to send the location over to your device. And this is this is really smooth. Like within a second, the map pops open with your route loaded. It's a really smooth experience. Uh, this is all based on uh, mostly Mapbox and other open source stuff. Uh, so the routing is, uh, I think it's basically based on Valhalla. Um, uh, and then we use the, the Mapbox driving API, which is built on Valhalla with them with some traffic uh, information sprinkled on top. A lot of Mapbox users sent their real-time location to Mapbox. So they have all this real-time traffic information, which is really nice for us to use. Um, and then we render that on top of some uh, very sharp vector tiles, uh, and they have like, this nice uh, OpenGL library uh, to render these. So it's it's very smooth, uh, and yeah, looks looks really nice. So you just get this turn by turn navigation. You even get lane uh, lane info if that's available. So in this case, we'll tell you to be in the leftmost lane, uh, and it will also tell you the the traffic, so we know how much uh, how long a route normally takes, and if it takes longer than that, we can see for each segment. Uh, if that's the case, then we can we can show that as well. Um, but then the big question, of course, is um, yeah. So it, 
what the future will look like. So it's important that you have comma prime uh, this pays for all the all the tiles and all the writing requests we do and uh, pays for all the infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, sign up uh, when you get your comma three. Just sign up for the trial immediately uh, and uh, enjoy this for a, a couple months uh, and see it. Just yeah, experience the navigation experience. And then the question is like, how how are we going to build this out to um, navigate on OpenPilot? So how we already talked about desire, which is this way to uh, signal to the lay, to the model that you want to make a lane change or keep left and keep right. Uh, and of course, this is going to be the first step to see uh, if navigation tells you to keep left, what, what will happen if we tell the model to do that. Um, but then we're also going to, uh, this is why it's very important that navigation is, is an on-device experience. Uh, we can render a nice view of the map and the routes uh, that's specifically meant for the model. And the model can take that in as like a fourth camera uh, and then actually can make decisions based on that. And I think if we all put that together, uh, train this with all the data that's coming back from the comma threes, I think uh, this is going to feel like a magical experience. Uh, so yeah, that was my presentation. Um, I hope you guys all saw what the, the NAV looks like in its current state. Uh, and I think once you try it out for the first time, it really feels like a, a magical experience. Um, and I think I've also shown how far we've come with OpenPath, how, how we've come from version 0 0.1 to version uh, 0 0.87. And I think this just shows how much more is possible and how good OpenPath is going to be in the future. So yeah, that was, uh, that was my talk.